Dear Madam, I have been shown in the files of the War Department a statement of the Adjutant General of Massachusetts that you are the mother of five sons who have died gloriously on the field of battle. I feel how weak and fruitless must be any words of mine which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming. But I cannot refrain from tendering to you the consolation that may be found in the thanks of the republic they died to save. I pray that our Heavenly Father may assuage the anguish of your bereavement and leave you only the cherished memory of the loved and lost and the solemn pride that must be yours to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. Yours, very sincerely and respectfully, A. Lincoln. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's letter to one Mrs. Bixby is controversial, but no doubt acknowledges the sacrifice that we have made as a nation for those who have bled on the battlefield for our freedom. And are we not mindful of them today on this Independence Day weekend? I want to talk to you this morning about the difference between a movement versus a museum. It's intended to be a heart cry for the soul of America. It centers in on one particular word this morning, Acts chapter 17, verse 28. A simple phrase, for in him we live and move and have our being. Acts 17, 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. I want us to look at that one word, move. Prior to World War II, this nation was in need of great healing. Healing from the Great Depression. In the midst of the Dust Bowl, with a population of 132 million people, 32% of our population was without running water. 44% had no inside bathtub or shower. The recovery, financially anyway, began in around 1933 with an unemployment rate of 25%. In 1940, 15% unemployment. The Great Depression, under the leadership of President Herbert Hoover, and then President Roosevelt was a trying time. Prior to World War II, the United States military was slow, small, and ranked 19th in the world behind Portugal. We were isolationists. We wanted no business with foreign matters. We were healing from World War I and the Great Depression. In the Pacific Rim, Emperor Hirohito of Japan was seen by his own people as a deity. In 1931, the Japanese invaded Manchuria and China in 1937. The world was becoming quite a different place in which to live. On December 7th, 1941, on that Sunday morning, some of you remember the attack on Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor was attacked, there was nothing, I emphasize nothing, between Hawaii and the coast of California to stop the Japanese from doing what the Japanese wanted so badly to do. In the European theater, the axis of power centered around Hitler, who came to power in 1933. He denounced the Treaty of Versailles in 1936. In an alliance with Benito Mussolini, a fascist dictator who had already, in 1935, invaded Ethiopia. It was the beginnings of World War II, and the U.S. as isolationists would have to change their opinion of how they would deal with the world in general. Four days after Pearl Harbor, Germany declared war on the United States of America with our weak military in place. We now had a war on two fronts. Our allies, under our leadership of Theodore Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin. In summation, we had a two-front war with two separate, distinctly evil philosophies, if not religions, 
that engaged in a physical war with our country, but at the same time, they were players in a spiritual battle for they sought to eradicate Jews, homosexuals, gypsies, and people of color. I was in Boston a few years back, walking through a uh, park. I noticed six glass towers, beautiful, lit up at night. I stopped as to inquire as to the purpose of these towers. As I got closer, I realized it was a memorial to the Holocaust. Towers are high, big panes of glass. As I approached them closely, I realized, and I was struck by the fact that every pane of glass, as tall as they were, had serial numbers on them of every person who died in the Holocaust. I was overwhelmed. There's an inscription on one tower that says, look at these towers, passerby, and try to imagine what they really mean, what they symbolize, what they evoke. They evoke an era of incommensurate darkness, an era in history when civilization lost its humanity and humanity its soul. But yet we look back and we say, this was the greatest generation. Why was this the greatest generation? Because they overcame adversity. There's much to be learned from the generation of World War II. They fought for and freed those who were oppressed. They liberated the oppressed. They came together as a band of brothers. How do we do that? In the midst of a spiritual battle that seeks to eradicate the truth. What do we learn from our own history so as to alleviate the need of repeating it? There were 334,000 military personnel in 1939. By the end of the war, from from year 40 to 46, there were 16 million people engaged in battle, with a maximum of 13 million at any one time. People got together and got the work done that needed to be done, for there was no alternative. The women in the service here at home, we could not have won the war without the workforce of women. Making, building, ammunition, the rosy riveters of the world who came together with unity and purpose and resolve, figured out a way to care for their children as the men of this country defended our freedom and the freedom of others. Each did their own part relentlessly, hour after hour after hour. They had a movement. I had the privilege of recently visiting the World War II Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana. It's a beautiful facility. Excellent. It is both informative and inspirational. But as I went through each of those incredible exhibits, I realized that museums inform us of history. Museums are necessary, and war is inevitable. Museums are air-conditioned, jungles are hot. Museums are orderly, battlefields are chaotic. Museums are inspiring, war is hell. Museums cost money, war costs lives. Museums are visited. Soldiers remain buried in foreign soil even to this day. Without a crisis, without strife, without tension, without tragedy, without all manners of evil, without genocide, without the human dilemma, without sin, war museums do not exist. Museums exist because of movements and no other reason. Without a movement, there's no museum worth attending. Art museums depend upon movements. Without the movement of creativity, without the movement of love, without the movement of romance, without the movement of inspiration, without the movement of of death and sickness and all the like, there's no art museums, there's no Sistine Chapel, there's no Vatican Museum, there's no Uffizi, there's no Academia, there's no David, there's no Mona Lisa, there's no Louvre. Movements are chronicled by museums. Acts 2 and 17, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Listen to me, gentlemen. 
Your young men will see visions. This is interesting. Your old men will dream dreams. Seems backwards to me. Seems like a young man ought to be dreaming dreams and an old man ought to see visions. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says that an old man should dream dreams. Your eulogy is your museum. Your eulogy chronicles the events and the movements of your life. What will be said to chronicle your life? And how is your life a movement? How are you, old man, dreaming dreams of your future on this earth? Have you already written your own history? Have you already stopped living? If you already stop moving, is there not a movement for you still in the latter days of your life? Is there not a purpose and a mission and a resolve? Is there not a coming together for there is no alternative to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ in this nation? I say there's a mission. I say there's a dream among those who should know better than to stop dreaming. Christian, there's work to do. We've got some things we need to rivet. Old men need to dream dreams. Church, is the movement over? Can we open a museum to talk about what happened in days gone by and yesteryear in the sweet old days of the 40s and 50s? Can we rehearse revivals that happen around the world like an old dusty museum? Or can we not get on our face before God and cry out for an outpouring of his Holy Spirit? We can sing open heaven. Do we await it? Do we ask for it? Church, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. The church has to stand for Israel in these last days. It's a mission. Are we defenders of the true gospel, not the distorted one, not the made up one, not the one on the fly, not the one full of political correctness, not the one full of moral relativism, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, who comes not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. Are we defenders of the gospel that brings about deep conviction, or conviction at all, I should say? We have to remember as the church and the movement that we have in the days ahead that we are fighting for, not against the liberation of the oppressed. We don't fight against the oppressed. We fight for the liberation of the oppressed. We have a battle with a purpose. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Let me say that again. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. There but for the grace of God go we. We are to fight for those who are oppressed. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers, darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The church of Jesus Christ on this Independence Weekend better start figuring out a movement that pulls down strongholds and principalities and doesn't blame people for their lot in life or governments. Don't take the bait to keep from praying as a movement against the very spirit we're for people enveloped and entangled in strongholds. We're for the government that God instituted. We're against the stronghold and the principalities that organize it and manipulate it and deceive it. In the words of the apostle Jack Nicholson, also known as Colonel Nason Jessup, it's time to pick up a weapon and stand your post. There's a movement necessary in the United States of America that needs to start in the hearts and the minds of the people on the pews of this country and the pulpits that will dare to preach the word of God. We need some spiritual warriors. Let's learn from our brothers and sisters in World War II. We need to provide some air support. We need to be praying more than we complain. Do more than we sit around. 
Stop grumbling like Israelites in the desert and pick up a weapon and start to pray. Do some political, social, governmental activism. Do something with what God has given us. What do you have? What breaks your heart? It's time for a movement. There's no doubt at all. War's been declared. Who's moving? We are soldiers of faith adorned in the regal armor of God. Make sure you don't sit on your sofa with your armor on. Watching so much news, you get so depressed, you just want to go to bed early and pray that Jesus returns. That is not what you and I are called to do. <laughs> My goodness gracious. <laughs> Personally, has your museum been built? Did you stop living already? Is that retirement? Is that it? Is it over? What is it now? Is that it? Just going to plant a few flowers and hang out? What are you doing? You're coming to the wrong church if that's what you want to do. I will bother you until the cows come home. <laughs> you come talk to me. I'll put you to work. We need some sweat equity in the kingdom. We need some people online. We need some political activism. We need some people speaking up for truth. We start some new ministries. We'll get you engaged. This nation. Should we go ahead and build a museum? Millions of evangelicals stayed home in both 2008 and 2012 and didn't even vote. Romans 13 and 1, the authorities that exist have been established by God. You know how God establishes authorities? He counts up votes. If your faith is without works, I got news for you. It's dead. Open a dadgum museum if you're done. If Christians can't get out and vote, it's over. If we don't even, if we celebrate the freedom that people have provided us to be a nation and we can't vote, stop celebrating freedom that's not exercised. We need to stay informed, communicate. You know, we had a great evening Wednesday with Congressman Meadows. He must have said it 13 different ways. Speak up. Use social media. Get online. Do something. Be an activist. Be heard. Have a voice. Get a skin in the game. We're on defense. We should be on offense. We're the single most powerful thing on the face of the earth. We're the temple of the spirit of the living God. We're soldiers in the army of God. We're wisest people. We know where we've been, we know where we are, and we know where we're going. The rest of the world has no clue on either of those three things at all. They have no idea where they're going. And it may be because we haven't told them. Museum or movement. For in him we live and move and have our being. You and I are called to be rivers, not lakes, not swamps, not bogs, not puddles, rivers. God is in the business of rivers. He was in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9 through 12, four headwaters flowing into one river, full of pure gold, precious stones, and pearls. Ezekiel 47 is about a river coming under the south end of the temple, and wherever it flowed, it flowed with life. We got, we're people of movement. We're people of, of, of life. We, we've got something that needs to flow into the lives of this nation. Are we flowing? Revelation 22 ends with a river. Genesis 2 starts with one. It's important. We've been reading, studying, preaching on the Gospel of John. Here you go. That first chapter has got the water in it. What kind of water? The kind that moves when you push someone down into a baptism. Water. The movement of water represents the dying to self and the coming to new life in Christ. That's what we're about. Chapter two, the water did not change to wine when it sat there, you had to pour it. There has to be movement, there has to be a strategy. There has to be something going on to change a nation, to change a church, to change a marriage, to change a family, to change a business. There has to be movement. 
If you're in the business of waiting on God to fix your problems, you are going to be bored the rest of your life. He's waiting on you to get off your blessed assurance and get involved. <laughs> Chapter 3, we can be born of water, but the water has to break. Chapter 1, we have to die. Chapter 2, we have to move. Chapter 3, we have to break. Life comes through a breaking, breaking of the heart, breaking of the mind. What breaks your heart, by the way? If nothing breaks your heart to the point you'll do something about it, then ask God to break it some more so we can take some action. Chapter four, that water just comes out of the well, deep down in the well, and it's cool and it's refreshing and it's satisfying, and you don't need five husbands and another guy who's not your husband that you're with now. The water that Christ wants to give the church right now is moving, cool, refreshing comes from a place of depth. It's, re it's satisfying, gratifying. It's empowering, invigorating. God wants a movement in this country. Chapter five. Well, I'm waiting for the angel to stir the water so I can get in the water and I'll be healed. Everybody knows, even the guy that sat there for 38 years, moving water has a healing component to it. You ever sat in a jacuzzi? Movement. Boom. This is what we need to do on an individual basis. This is what we need to do on a congregational basis. And this is what the Church of Jesus Christ, the United States of America needs to do. Get moving. There's, there's healing involved. There's refreshing involved. There's satisfaction involved. There's brokenness involved. There's, there's the blood of Jesus Christ being poured out on the lost involved. There's new life. Chapter six, Jesus walks on the water. What he's trying to do every time he turns around is water. There's a water example. He's trying to say, listen, I transcend the natural law of man. I can do the miraculous. I can do it. Just get in the game with me. God blesses movement. You want to see God move in your life? You better get moving too. Because he moves so fast, you're sitting still, you're going to miss it. Are you engaged? Are you praying? Are you on your face? Are you in the word? Are you, are you actively involved in your government? Are you online with global uh, uh, media outreach? Are you reaching people with the gospel? Move. Old men dream dreams. Go home and figure out what you're gonna do in the next 20 years of your life. Move. Whoever is thirsty, he says in chapter seven, out of you will flow living water. What am I saying to you this morning? I'm saying we feel weak. We feel like we have a, a weak military. We feel like we have no budget. We feel like we come out of the Great Depression. We're sitting around feeling sorry for ourselves the past week and a half. Come together like a band of brothers. Get to praying. Talk, encourage. Tell your, brother, uh, your fellow brother and sister to stop complaining. It's messing up the whole thing. People sit around and the sad sack complaining about how the world's falling apart? Come on. We got the answer. We need to hold one another accountable to stop your complaining. Do all things without arguing or complaining. It sucks the life out of the church. Go home and do it in your prayer closet. Tell it with God. I don't want to hear it. We got too much to do. We need to reach people. Here's some suggestions on how to move, saints. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord, listen to me, please. Right now, there's a sweet presence of the Lord in this place. You may, never, may not be aware of it. I'm fully aware of it. And let me tell you something. When the presence of the Lord is such that you can sense his presence, I'll tell you what happens. You end up with clarity. Clarity. So you're outside the Lord, you don't like the church, you don't like me, whatever. Join the club, a lot of people don't like me. But right now, in the next few minutes, listen to what I have to say, because I'm gonna offer you something with clarity. You go back in the world, it's not gonna be clear. Here, it's gonna be crystal clear. If only for a few moments, consider what you hear right now. How do we move? Some of us need to move back. That's right, we need to move back. What do I mean? 
You need to move back in the church. You were there years ago. You're on your way, and you left. And I'll tell you what's happening. You're out there conforming to any and everything that the world wants you to do. Here's the clarity. Underneath all the rationalization and all the excuses, I'm talking down where your heart is, where we prayed that you would be open, you're not satisfied. You're not satisfied. You're thirsty. And it's time to move back. Come on back. Come on home wherever that is, find yourself a church. Go see the pastor and tell him I need to come back home. What you're doing out there is not who you're called to be. You've handcuffed God. He can't work with that. What you think is your identity is not. It's rooted and established in him. It's time to come home, move home, move back. That'll be clear for the next few minutes. I don't know about the next few days. But as long as you came here, you might as well get what you were supposed to. Number two, move on. Move on. Okay. You were hurt. Okay. I know. I'm not, I'm not belittling that. I know you were hurt. I know. I know you lost. You know you lost. I know he cheated on you. I know you shouldn't have been fired. For some of us, it's been enough time for us to move on. Because we're building a museum that chronicles our life lived in the past at the expense of the future. It's time to move on. Some of you are just lost somebody. It's not time to move on. It's time to hurt. It's time to mourn. I'm not talking about that. Move on. No museum. Next one, I want to encourage some of you to move out. Move out. I'm not trying to be cute. But this country, a lot of people are coming out of the closet. And we still got a Christianity in the closet. Move out. You and I are not called to have some personal, private faith. I don't know where people come up with that. It's the greatest indication they have no idea what they're talking about. Move out. Come out of the closet with your faith. People who know what you believe and you never, ever articulate it, share it, or demonstrate it in front of other people, they discount what you believe because of the absence of you sharing it. And they wonder what you have against them to keep them from hearing what means so much to you. Come out of the closet, will you please? Move back, move on, move out. Move in. Some of you need to move into the kingdom of God. There's a... This is an incredible thing. Let me tell you about the kingdom of God. It's got a ruler and a reign. People mess with him all the time, but he doesn't change who he is, what he said, or what he's doing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's the prince of peace, the bright morning star. He's the bishop of our souls, and he died for you. And nothing anyone says or does or any decision, any court case, any, anything's going to change who he is. And he's never going to leave you nor forsake you. Once you acknowledge who he is and invite him into your heart, it's time to move in. 
It's time to be saved. It's time to be born again. It's time to stop the nonsense and acknowledge who you know he is. The king of all kings and the Lord of all lords who loved you with an unconditional love in such a manner he gave up his life to save you, to take from you the very penalty that was yours that you were lined up to receive. He took it and demonstrated his love for you while you were yet a sinner. Oh, people walking around, people asking me every now and again, do you think so-and-so's a sin? Do you think so-and-so's a sin? Do you think this is a sin? I'm a little unclear, is this a sin? I got news for you, most everything's sin. God, what are we picking, picking and choosing for? You sin, every person in here sinned 100 times since you walked in. We're looking at sin. We're just looking at sin. Is that a sin? Is that a sin? Is this a good sin, bad sin, medium sin? Is this going to hurt sin? Am I going to pay for this sin? Hey, take your eyes off the sin and put it on the grace. Anybody comes to me and says, your church is full of hypocrites. I'm going to say, no, they're not full of sinners. It's time to move in. It's time to move away. Listen. I used to come to church. This is a confession here. I don't know if I should even say it. I came to church so hungover. Such a stench of alcohol in my breath that about two pews shouldn't have driven home. They'd look back at me, and they'd look around. I'd have to sit in a different place every time I went to church. What is that? Who is that? No one ever said anything to me. They loved me. They hugged me. They held my hand. They looked me in the eye. They kissed me on the cheek. They got makeup on my coat. Oh, man. I'd love to have a church with seven people in it with a hangover. That'd be awesome. I could barter with the Lord. How about eight? Twelve? I'd like to have 12 people with a hangover in here right now. That'd be fantastic. But we need to move away from what? Christian, it's time to move away from the sin that so easily entangles you. It's time for us to move away so that we can be effective soldiers in an army that's moving in a direction that's changing the landscape of people's hearts and minds. You know, there's some places that people in this church have no business being. You didn't need me to tell you that. There's some places you just have no business being. There's some people you have no business being with. Be holy because I am holy, God says. And we need to move beyond. Beyond fear. God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but of love of power and a sound mind. Beyond self-consciousness. Beyond being egocentric. Beyond the fear of man, we need to get, this church needs to keep doing, we're doing a good job, we need to keep getting freed up and not worry about what other people think. If you get in trouble, blame it on me. I'm a big boy, I can take it. Move back, move on, move out, move into, move away, and move beyond. Community Bible Church. There it is. Movement or museum? You decide. Movement or museum? If we're done, tell me. Because I'll go move on. If we're not done, let's get moving. Let's be slow to speak when it comes to complaining, quick to listen. And let's start doing some fervent, effectual praying in this church.
to pull down the various strongholds or a blame for all the people who are oppressed in this world. When people were in Auschwitz, we didn't blame them for being oppressed. We went after the source. We eradicated the source and the people were freed. This nation is going to reveal in the days ahead many people who are oppressed, confused, angry. They're not the problem. It's the one behind it all, pulling the strings. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, let me say something to you. This is the most unfair thing for you. You're being asked to judge Christianity apart from the Holy Spirit. This is a bummer. I looked at Christianity and I said, no stinking way I could do that. I can't do that. I can't put seven days of, of decent activity together, decent behavior. I don't have any desire to read a book that was written 2,000 years ago. I have no stinking idea what Christianity is all about. I'm ashamed. I don't want anybody to ask me a question. I couldn't do that. I couldn't listen to a sermon. I can't sing. I went 10 years looking at a hymn book. I don't know what as a kid I thought. I thought you just read right on down through the hymn. They skip all those things. I was singing the wrong song for years in the church. I was such a woodhead. But I'll tell you when I began to look at Christianity different. When that Spirit of God, <laughs> you're going to think I'm crazy. When that Holy Spirit washed over me. I drove home from a Bible study one time with a friend of mine. I, I, I had so much joy I couldn't stop laughing. I thought it was hilarious that I was at a Bible study. First of all, that I was at a Bible study. I couldn't believe it. I, I thought it was so funny, I laughed at myself. When that man said you can take off your old self and put on your new, it's kind of like a jacket. You take it off and put on Christ. And I thought, oh my gosh, what's he talking about? And all of a sudden, that spirit came on me. You know, God will give you the desire of your heart, but you know when that spirit comes on you, your heart changes and so does your desire. And he still gives you the desire of your heart. It's just different. If you're not in Christ right now, and you heard me say, I want you to move back. You've been in the church. Move back. It's time to, it's time to reestablish, re-engage. It's time to get in the army here. Let me say something to you. You take one step, the Lord will take 99, and he'll put his spirit upon you. You accept him as your Lord. Your entire motivation in life's going to change. Your right becomes left. Your left becomes right. Straight becomes crooked. You don't, you don't know what happened to you. The only thing that changes when you come to Christ and you accept him, there's only one thing that changes, everything. You get caught up in this whirlwind of, I'm not the same person I used to be. Why am I thinking this way? Why am I not laughing at what was just said? Why did I just not say what I usually say? And it's the spirit of the living God that comes in you and wells up out of you like rivers of living water. It changes the way you think. He changes what you feel, what you want, what you're called to. He'll change your occupation, your career, your marriage, your, your children, your parenting, your everything. You actually get up in the morning and go, oh my gosh, I just realized I don't have a million problems. You see everything different. I don't like it when Christians bash movies they've never seen. And I don't like non-Christians telling me that Christianity's a joke when you've never had a taste of this living water of which I speak. Don't get drunk on wine that leads to debauchery. And he follows that up, but get drunk on the spirit. Why? The spirit alters your mind. It gives you greater courage, just like wine does. It gives you less inhibition. It gives you less self-consciousness. It gives you a freedom and a movement. Oh, gosh. In this church, we need to be praying for the infilling of the Holy Spirit every 20 minutes. In the world we live in, if that's not on your lips, what are you doing? We're in a movement here. 
Every soldier in World War II that went out to the battlefield, they had a pack and a weapon and training and a strategy and three hots and a cot. They had authority over them. They had people beside them. They had a mission. They were freeing the oppressed. Everything they needed was taken care of. God's not going to leave you wanting. Some of you need to come home. Some of you need to come in. Some of us need to move way beyond and way over to things that are saddling us and making us living, walking museums that chronicle what used to be that keep us from what could be. We need a flow of the Spirit in this church. And people so desperate cry out and drink of this living water of which I speak that there's no stopping them. Maybe you're in your own Great Depression. Maybe you're not fortified. Maybe you're broke. Maybe you're in despair. Maybe you see no way out. I don't know. I live in a country where people fought a two-front war against some of the greatest concentration intense evil of all time and somehow won it danced in the streets celebrating how they overcame what makes them the greatest generation? God. What else makes us great? But God. He's mighty. He's mighty powerful. He's mighty in strength, mighty in power, mighty in wisdom. I want to ask you a question today. And I promise you I won't embarrass you. We're going to sing this song in just a second. Is there someone here? You say to yourself, you know what, he's right. I'm floundering around out there and I ain't getting what I need. I'm trying to fake it till I make it, but I'm empty. It's time to move back. Anybody need to move back to the church? Just raise your hand, it's okay, I'm not gonna embarrass you. You need to move back, thank you. Anyone else? Anybody need to move on? Past the hurt? Past everything else that's stymieing you? Yeah, I hear that. Some of you need to come out of the closet with your Christianity and being an ambassador for Christ. No matter what the situation, here's what I can tell you with great confidence. He's mighty enough to do it. And you and I are not. But we make a pretty good team. And whatever battle you got ahead of you, you can overcome it. Despite your lack of weaponry. If you have him in your heart. Old men, dream dreams. Take somebody with you. Let's get moving.